An African king, the Emir of Katsina in northern Nigeria, rides out from his palace for the annual parade and festival called the Salah at the end of the Muslim fast of Ramadan. The idea of kingship as a means of tackling the problems of government is as old and established in Africa as in any other continent. Surrounded by his bodyguards and by troops of loyal followers, the king receives the allegiance of his people. The king no longer has any real political power, but he is the traditional ruler of an ancient city and kingdom of the Hausa, one of many African peoples who built their own organized states over the past thousand years. Kings need to display their wealth, and if they're wise, they also provide entertainment. But above all, kings need to display their power and authority in ways that are clear to everyone. The Salah is also a political event. Even today, this is more than a mere display. It's an act of recognition. The king is accompanied by royal guards in the finery of an ancient military tradition. Some have equipment and body armor that seem to go back to long lost Christian Nubia and even to the time of the Crusades. All now await the ritual act of allegiance by the lesser chiefs of Katsina, the Jaffi. Wave upon wave, in a gesture which is part threatening and part submissive, the district heads salute their master. Of course, there is a great deal more in history than the drama of kings and queens. A lot of African peoples found it easy, and indeed better, to do without royal masters. Yet kingship clearly remained an important part of the story, and the facts of Africa's historical development reveal a wide variety of kingdoms and empires. Most of the old kingdoms have vanished long since, and all the old empires, but some of them have left behind, for us, magnificent reminders of their majesty and power. This astonishing sculpture in gleaming copper represents one of the rulers, or Oni, of the Kingdom of Ife in western Nigeria seven or eight centuries ago. And yet when these superb sculptures first came to the attention of Europeans, only as recently as 1910, the experts at once pronounced that Africans could never have conceived or made them and that some wandering European must have been the artist. Now the world knows better. The truth is that these are portraits of African kings made by African artists for use in royal ceremonial. South from Ife and near the coast, there flourished the ancient city and empire of Benin. This old print, following a Dutchman's visit in about 1620, shows the king of Benin riding out to receive the plaudits of his people.
Benin artists, beginning at least as early as 1400, had long been developing their own styles and techniques, styles that were entirely African in inspiration and execution. They have their place today among the artistic masterpieces of the world. This ivory armlet places the king where he belonged in Benin society at the center of all things. Plaques in brass, which once adorned the walls of the Orba's palace, reinforce the power and mystery of the king. A visitor from Holland to the king of Benin in about 1600 wrote this report. The city is composed of 30 main streets, very straight and wide. The houses are arranged in good order. The people are in no way inferior to the Dutch in cleanliness. Their houses are as polished as a looking glass. They have good laws and efficient police and show us a thousand marks of friendship. Oba, king of men, could handle leopards, the kings of the forest, like toys. From his waist sprang mudfish, symbols of power over sea and river, whose guardian was Olicum, archangel of the waters. The king had great authority, but this depended on the support of noblemen and appointed chiefs, and on certain persons of ritual power. Among these were the Queen Mothers of Benin, one of whom is shown in this memorable head, sculpted in about 1550. Adjoining Benin was the ancient empire of the Yoruba people, with its heart in the city of Oyo. The Yoruba developed great military strength based on cavalry. In matters of state, the King of Oyo had to consult his council, the Oyo Macy. If the council were united against him, the king was in trouble. In theory, he was supreme, whether in religious affairs or secular matters. But if he lost the confidence of the Oyo Macy, he could even face death. Such was the authority of the council that if they turned against him, the king might have to commit suicide. So kingly power in old Africa was a two-edged sword and rulers had to use it with care. When at last Europeans reached these shores, they came at first in peace, as traders or ambassadors asking favors. The king could grant trading permits, which he did in return for handsome gifts. Great deference was shown by these European visitors, and many accounts speak with admiration of the splendor of African kings, their courts and their palaces. The cities, too, were large and impressive enough to command European respect. This was certainly true of the Hauser city of Kano, painted here by the German traveler Heinrich Barth during a visit in 1851. The Hauser people lived in a cluster of independent states north of the junction of the Niger and Benue rivers. Each state had its own capital, like Katsina or Kano. Kano today is one of the major cities of modern Nigeria and like most of our world has lost some of its reverence for kingly power, smothered beneath the motor cars and the main roads. But Kano still has some vestiges of its ancient dignity, including parts of the old city wall. 
Restored and preserved behind metal barricades, some of the old gates still pierce these crumbling ramparts first built in the reign of King Tsariki during the 12th century. Modern Kano is as brash and noisy as any African city of our time. With its concrete office blocks, its traffic jams, its utterly persistent roadside vendors and imperious police force. Although the principal mosque is modern, it's still possible to find traditional houses side by side with the new. These old townhouses were designed to match the hot, dry climate of the Western Sudan. And Kano's trading visitors often feel at home with older ways of life. Like so much else in Nigeria today, this modern city of Kano has grown out of an ancient civilization and from a local enterprise practiced through a long period of early development. Kano's story through the centuries became one of singular drama and brilliance. Ever since the Middle Ages, this old city has been a magnet for countless travelers, a place of rest after hard journeys, a seat of scholarship and of royal power, and a market echoing with the din and traffic of the whole Western Sudan. Trade has been a major activity in Kano since early times and has grown in importance with the city itself. Some of these goods have been traded for hundreds of years, such as rock salt from the Sahara and pepper and spices from the south. And from about 1500 onwards, a new commodity, brought from the forest lands and much prized as a stimulant, kola nuts. Whether the trade was long distance or local, Kano was, as it is today, a place where there was money to be made and goods manufactured for sale. The reasons for Kano's prosperity go back to the origins of the city. This small hill, so barren and so empty, contains within its past another of the surprises of African history. To reach its secret, we have to go back more than a thousand years. At that time, before or about AD 900, people came and settled and began to build a little town here on this hill, which they called Dala. To begin with, Dala was just another hill settlement a source of iron ore and a place of refuge, otherwise no more important than many other small villages scattered across Hauserland. The early history of the region tells of rivalry between these villages, and Kano, well placed to take advantage of the natural wealth of the region, gradually emerged as the most powerful settlement in its area. According to the Kano Chronicle, an ancient record of remembered history, the early kings then set about extending their rule. One by one, they outmaneuvered their rivals and absorbed their lands, much like the warring barons of feudal Europe. The royal palace, Gedan Runfa, was built in the 15th century. But the ritual pomp and circumstance of the court dates from much earlier times. <laughs> Preceded by women praise singers who tell the world of his power and glory, the King of Kano emerges from the inner palace for his daily round of public duties.
For centuries, the court has been run by a small army of officials, some born in service, others descended from noble families. In the old days, these officials ensured that limits were placed on the power of the king. He had his council, consisting of uh, four traditional king bikers. Uh, these were the Madaki of Kano, the Makama of Kano, the Sarkindawa Kimetuta of Kano, and the Sarkimbai of Kano, which of course is myself. And uh, we, uh, they used to give advice to the Emir on all matters. The person of the king himself was shrouded in mystery. Even the simple action of sitting down on his throne had to be concealed from public gaze. Only then could lesser chiefs draw near to pay elaborate homage. The king's face and most of the rest of his person were obscured from public view. His royal feet were not supposed to touch the ground. The ostrich feather sandals were part of his exclusive regalia. But in spite of all this prestige, there were strict limits to the king's authority. The four kingmakers had the power to choose the heir to the throne from any one of the male children of the royal family. The king was dependent on the cooperation of a large hierarchy of lesser chiefs. This was a kind of constitutional monarchy. The power of the nobles was checked by the authority of slave officials appointed by the king. These were not slaves in the modern sense, but much more like the royal retainers of European monarchs. Kano even had its own jester, licensed to tell awkward truths when others preferred tactful silence. <laughs> But there were other royal servants with great authority. A leading nobleman of Kano, the Makaman. Well, slave officials, there were four, two. That is, Shamakin Kano, Salama, Dairini, and Kilishi, slaves. Although men of noble birth might still call them slaves, these royal servants, just like the king's men of European monarchs, could wield decisive influence. One of the most powerful of them was an official still known as the Shamaki. The Shamaki was responsible for the royal stables. Today there are only a few horses, but cavalry were once vital to the security of the state. The cavalry were the armoured divisions of their time. Even today the royal horses are valued so highly that they're fed every morning by hand. The Shramaki's position was one of crucial trust because whoever controlled the cavalry controlled the kingdom. But he himself owed his position directly to the king's patronage. Only a foolish official would bite the hand that feeds him. Another so-called slave official was the Salama. The Salama had responsibility for the royal arsenal and he had direct access to the king. When 
amanar da na ga maka ta gidansa da amanar abun gaba kamar su bindiga su su kibiya su lufudda to duk iko musalma ne Guns were rare in old Kano, and the king did his best to monopolize them for his royal bodyguard of musketeers. These were housed in the palace itself. Gunpowder is still manufactured in the palace arsenal, but it's only issued today for festivals and celebrations. Control of the bodyguard is vested in the Salama. This parade may be a bit of a joke, but the power once exercised by these appointed officials was real enough. Their task was to safeguard the security of the state. Early Kano had its own religion. Its beliefs involved ancestors, local spirits, and various natural forces. Many of these beliefs centered on a cult which endures to this day known as Bori. The Bori ritual is extremely old. This form of it, nowadays little more than a popular entertainment, still carries an echo of its old magical persuasion. Over the centuries, as Kano's links with the outside world increased, the spirit cults gradually declined. They gave way to the modernizing influence of a world religion, Islam. <laughs> Islam came here a thousand years ago, but its real impact began with the arrival of Muslim traders from Mali around the year 1300. These were the Wangarawa, whose learning and prosperity reinforced the teachings of the Quran. Slowly, Muslim influence widened until the great majority of the Kano people, led by their king, answered the call of the Prophet. By the middle of the 15th century, the power and wealth of Kano had grown to a point at which a new and enterprising ruler needed to develop more modern forms of government. Mohammed Runfa, one of the most famous kings of the old Habe dynasty, sent for a North African expert in Muslim law and custom named Al Magili. Al Haji Maita Masuli explains. Sheikh Magili, after having studied, and after having become very learned and world famous in Islamic studies, decided to come to this part of the country to establish himself, which he did in Kano. He came during the reign of Muhammad al-Rumfa, a very well-known, very famous, and very scholarly emir of Kano during the Harvey days. 
Al-Magili advised the king to set an example to his people in religious matters, since religion and authority went together. The king enforced the Sharia, the Muslim legal code, and formed a panel of Islamic judges, the Qadis, to preside over the courts. The present chief caddy of Kano, Dr. Hassan Guazo, is an expert on Al Magili's teachings. In fact, he devised two types of courts that is, courts of first instance and also court of appeal. The court of first instance were the courts to be, to, to be meant by the caddies. But the court of appeal was that of the emir himself, that is the emir in council, that is people aggrieved by the decisions of the parties or by the attitude of any official of the, of the, of the emir have got a right to go direct to the emir himself. <laughs> In a book called The Obligations of Princes, al Magili set down a number of rules for the king to follow in the affairs of state. He warned the ruler that he shouldn't contempt himself with informations uh, brought, uh, brought to him by his officials. Because he, he said, uh, because sometimes uh, complaints might be against the officials. And therefore, the emir should be always accessible and that is why we see in the history of kingship in Kano from those days to this present time that the emir has got has the practice of coming out always uh, sitting in a place where everybody can see him and uh, you can see that this is even done even today but if justice was in theory available to everyone, it was also sharply administered. <laughs> the king and his council had the same power of life and death as their contemporaries in Europe. He had the power to, ex to ex say somebody, if somebody had killed somebody, or the Amy and together with his legal advisors, would go through the case. And then if that person was absolutely guilty, the Emir would send him to the to the hanging place. He, he had his head cut off. The authority of the king was very great. But like other African kings of that time, including those of Benin and Oyo, he could not be a despot. He administered the law, but he also had to obey it. He ruled his council, but he also had to defer to it. <laughs> In some ways, African kingdoms were ahead of those in Europe in devising checks and balances to limit the power of the king. al Magili was building on earlier traditions of African political administration when he made rules for the exercise of royal power. Then later he wrote a constitution. And it was in this constitution that he provided for the establishment of a public complaints commission. Wilayat al in Arabic, which literally means Public Complaints Commission, the institution of ombudsman. So you see, about 500 years ago, even more, we had this institution of ombudsman in house land. But the king remained at the center of all things, especially at the center of spiritual power. For the celebration of a major religious festival, the king still leads the prayers of his people.
Yet men don't live by prayer alone. The coming of Islam also helped to improve business dealings with Muslim merchants and traders right across northern and western Africa. Kano and its neighboring city-states lived within a wide regional community of productive interchange of manufacturers, people and ideas. They were fortunate in being placed in a land that lay between the frontiers of large empires. On the east, the Kanuri Empire of Kanem and of Bornu, and on the west, the ancient Mandinka Empire of Mali and the Sonrai Empire of the Middle Niger. The expanding production and trade of all these famous countries of the old Sudan enclosed the Hausa within a far-ranging network of caravan trails and transport. Camels provided the essential haulage system for a flourishing import-export business. Kano prospered as a commercial center. In the market, a leather worker hand stitches part of a camel saddle, one of many highly prized products which established Kano's reputation for skilled craftsmanship and manufacture. Kano leather work became so famous that it was traded across the Sahara as far as Morocco. From there it was sold again to Europe, even to buyers in England, where it became known as Morocco leather. <laughs> Saddle blankets of quilted cotton, still made in Kano, have always been a valued item of trade and manufacture. Another textile, unique to the Kano area, was once so much in demand that it was traded the length and breadth of the Western Sudan. The story of these tightly woven rolls of cloth demonstrates the complexity and sophistication of traditional Kano industry. First, the weavers turn out long strips of white cloth on the narrowest looms anywhere in the world, a technique which produces an extremely dense weave. In the village of Kura, just outside Kano city, the strips of cloth are then sold to local businessmen. At this stage, they look like long, narrow bandages. The cloth buyers then arrange for the strips to be sewn together into broad widths of material. These are then taken to the nearby village of Bunkere for the next stage of the process. Dyeing with indigo is another ancient craft, long carried out in the Kano region. Here again one sees how Africans have evolved their own techniques for specific needs. In this case, the need has been, and still is, to produce a fine, darkly dyed material for buyers far and wide, but especially for the Tuareg of the Sahara Desert, who long ago adopted it as their traditional dress. The process has to be repeated over and over. The longer the process, the deeper the dye. Simple though the technique may appear to be, this is only one of several stages of manufacture. Periodically sprayed with water and pounded for hours on end, the finished product acquires a sheen that's much admired.
It's this highly polished blue cloth which is then traded out of Kano market to make turbans for local dignitaries and veils for the Tuareg, the blue man of the desert. The manufacture and sale of textiles has been a staple industry in the villages around Kano for many centuries. Strips from looms like this, when sewn together into broad widths, were sold as robes or blankets to every people and kingdom in Western Africa. Here then was a nicely balanced community of interests between countryside and city, between producers and consumers. Industry and commerce guaranteed the city's prosperity. Whole villages which once were part of the Kano Kingdom are given over to the manufacture of pottery. Once the pots are dried, they're taken to a central kiln for firing. Here, literally hundreds of pots can be fired at the same time. A cooperative system for the mass production of cooking vessels. Governing and exploiting all this industry and trade were the king and his council. The king enjoyed great wealth and enormous prestige. He was always the centre of attention, surrounded by courtiers and officials. He could never afford to relax, even when confronted by the grotesque mockery of his jester. But alone in the royal garden within the palace walls, he could be his own man. Sheltered from his subjects, the king could try his hand at manual labour. Women are rarely seen by visitors to the palace. These women, entertaining themselves in one of the courtyards, are the wives and relatives of palace officials. The wives and numerous concubines of the king himself are never allowed to venture from the inner palace. Muslim practice and royal prudence combine to keep them in seclusion. The present emir, like the kings of Kano before him, has many children. The political advantage of large numbers of children is that it provides a royal clan to shore up the king's power. Sons to help in administration, daughters to strengthen alliances. And instead of having to accept the oldest boy as the royal heir, the kingmakers could select the ablest. All this huge establishment had to be supplied with the basic necessities. The palace has always had a number of communal kitchens. Today, food must be bought at the market, but in the past it was taken from farms around the city as a form of taxation. The city and the palace depended on the countryside. The Hausa people's stable crop has always been guinea corn, known here as dawa, which has been grown in Africa for several thousand years. Oh, my God. 
The king and the city exploited the country people, and the whole edifice of royal pomp and pageantry rested ultimately on the shoulders of the Hausa farmers. As early as the 11th century, records tell of the unpopularity of royal taxation. Fortunately, the countryside around Kano was unusually fertile. The great Arab traveller, al wasan who visited Kano early in the 16th century, was astonished at the agricultural wealth of the area. He wrote in his memoir, Here groweth an abundance of corn, of rice and of cotton. By the 16th century, grain was grown for sale as well as for domestic use. Within the kingdom, donkey caravans provided the transport system and assured the city of its food supply. Cattle have been the other great agricultural resource on these broad plains. The king himself and other prosperous city dwellers often owned cattle, which were grazed for them by professional herdsmen. Village and city life became interdependent in Hausa civilization, two sides of the same coin. Yet the indispensable source of wealth in Hauserland was not the city, but always the village, whether for production of food or of cotton or other manufactures. Village people paid taxes in cash or in kind to the king of Kano because he was powerful, but essentially because they depended on him and his government to keep law and order in the land, and when foreign enemies appeared, to protect them with the royal army. Armies were raised, just as in feudal Europe, by requiring noblemen and village chiefs to call up their servants and retainers to fight for the king in time of war. The king had some trained soldiers in his bodyguard, but most of his troops were part-time infantry, none too keen on winning glory. Again, it was al Magili who advised the king to maintain a small standing army. Have beside you at all times a band of faithful and gallant men, sentries, bowmen, horse and foot. Times of alarm are not like times of safety. In that period of African history, kings and armies behaved very much as they did in Europe at the same time. Hauser states intrigued, formed alliances, broke them and betrayed one another in a long series of minor wars. Today the Kano army may be a trifle rusty, but when the bullhorn calls for courage, they do their best to dramatize the old assault tactics. And then, of course, comes grand confusion, just as in all the best regulated warfare.
Victory. Then everyone dances. But these small wars, it seems, killed few and only occasionally destroyed the peace and confidence of every day. The Hauser people who built Kano and other Hauser city-states were the makers of a strongly conscious, vivid and independent civilization. They owed much to the culture of Islam and much to their skills in manufacture for the long-distance trade, but were always, in the end, sufficient to themselves. They formed one of the great historic communities of old Africa. So the King of Kano, when he rides forth to greet his people, even today remains the symbol of a long development stretching back into the ancient past, very much remembered by the Hausa themselves. 500 years ago, Al Magili gave this advice to the King. Ride the horses of resolution on the saddles of prudence. Kingdoms are held by the sword, not by hesitation. Can fear be thrust back except by causing fear? The parade is a demonstration of royal power. In all this lies the varied and contrasting panoply of civilization that Africans have made for themselves. A history so strangely unknown to people in the outside world, almost as though it had never existed. Africa's history is unique to itself, but it's also part of humanity's common inheritance. It's a story that can still unfold, even in the festivals of today, a powerful mystery and splendor. Each of the ancient kingdoms of Africa developed its own customs and beliefs and laws, yet each of them served the same three great duties, to provide a focus of faith and loyalty, to protect the people from enemies abroad and at home to preserve the peace. Their record of success or failure, justice or injustice, has been remarkably like the record of other kingdoms in the world. In that heritage, we have all shared. <laughs>